Hello, good morning, and welcome to our first Reimagining Public Health for New York City. My name is Dr. Julian L. Watkins. I'm an internal medicine doctor, and I'm a health, edu health equity advisor within the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of Health Equity Capacity Building. Uh, I work in the division for uh, called the Center uh, for Health Equity and Community Wellness. I'm very, very excited today to be here with you all um, to celebrate um, the new year, to bring in the new year with a really um, exciting and rousing panel of uh, national experts um, to talk about a topic that I love and care about so deeply, health equity. But I think specifically um, our conversation today um, about building institutional accountability is so timely and so important. And so we're just really um, grateful and happy to be here today. We want to welcome you all to our, um, to our first Reimagining Public Health for New York City of the year. Um, so to begin, uh, I just wanted to warm the space up a little bit. Um, you know, it's been a long year, um, usually around you know, the changes in seasons, changing in years, we tend to do a lot of reflection. We tend to look at the last year and kind of take an account of the things that went well, the things that didn't go well. And then we like also like to look forward, you know, what do we want to move towards? What do we want to see more of? Who do we want to become in the new year? And I think that um, as, you know, this last year that we just went through, it's definitely been a tough one. You know, these last couple of years have been tough when we think about all the crises that we're attending to, you know, looking at what's what continues to go on in Ukraine, you know, what's happening, um, the crisis in Iran, um, looking at other international crises, um, but also looking in the homeland, you know, looking at all of the political turmoil and strife, you know, climate change, all of these things that are happening. And then when we just talk about, um, you know, in our realm, you know, in public health, there's a lot going on. Um, we look at these health disparities that seem to not be getting that much better when you look at some of the data. But even when we look at, I think we should name, you know, the crises that our practitioners, the folks who are the caregivers, the healers, what we're all dealing with. Um, I think we should name, you know, in New York City, there is a large nursing strike. And I think it just really goes to, you know, speaks to the moment um, of the urgency of this moment. Um, and so when I was thinking about and reflecting on today's talk, I was reminded of this uh, this book that I'm reading by Dr. Michelle Moody Adams. She's, um, she's a philosopher at Columbia uh, University. She came out with this book called named uh, Making Space for Justice. And it's a really deep um, in, um, investigation into what we can learn from the work of justice, from social justice movements. And I really appreciated the book because um, she offered this definition of like what we're all working towards. Um, she named social justice movements. And I think health equity is itself a, a movement, you know, it's a decades long movement that builds on a lot of work from a lot of scholars, a lot of um, activists, a lot of researchers, a lot of visionaries in health, but also outside of health. Um, and when we think about where social justice is getting us towards, what was the civil rights movement moving us towards? What was the, um, the feminist movement? What was the gay liberation movement moving us towards? And I think um, Dr. Adams named this concept of humane regard, you know, this combination of compassionate concern for the capacity of human suffering, uh, but also a robust respect uh, for the capacity for human agency and really thinking about what we're moving towards and what we're trying what we're talking about when we talk about building an equitable future um, it's not just um, data right it's not just getting the numbers to look better we're really talking about some really deep change in the way that we look at the work that we do in the way that we look at the institutions that we are maintaining and that it, many of us are running um, it's how we it's how we see our work as health practitioners as healers um, um, and so I, I just wanted to offer that opening um, and really think about this concept of humane regard, what we're building towards as we open up this conversation uh, about institutional accountability. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, oops, give me one second. I just lost that. All right. So we will start off with our top left in, uh, on my screen, Dr. Michelle Morse. Sorry. Thanks, Julian. Did you want me to jump in, or sorry, were you going to? Um, I'll, I'll let folks introduce themselves. Uh, we, folks can, can Google us, but I'll let you introduce yourselves. Just kind of say, you know, um, you know, who you are, what you're bringing into this conversation. Beautiful. Thank you, um, Dr. Watkins, for setting up 
the conversation. Um, Happy New Year to everyone who's tuning in. Um, my name is Dr. Michelle Morse. I'm an internal medicine and public health doctor. I serve as the chief medical officer for the New York City Health Department and deputy commissioner for Checkwell, the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness. Um, it is truly an honor to be here. My trajectory over the past 15 years in doing this work, both in the global south as well as here in the U.S., um, has certainly taught me tremendous amounts about um, what is possible when we work together, um, what is possible when we express solidarity in every aspect of the way that we approach health equity work and what's possible in terms of changing and transforming our institutions, um, which all of us or many of us either know by personal experience, family experience or otherwise, um, we have a long way to go um, to achieve health justice. And so um, I'm coming to this conversation, um, looking forward to learning from the other panelists um, with appreciation for um, the space that we have today to kick off the new year um, and with a lot of hope um, about how much more um, we, can, we can, how much further we can go in terms of building our solidarity and alignment in the movement for health equity. Thank you so much, Dr. Morse. Um, and next we'll have Dr. Elitha Maybank, MD, MPH, Chief Health Equity Officer and Senior Vice President for the American Medical Association. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. And it's just, um, it's really awesome to be in community at this early in the year um, with all of the folks and women and that I've known, you know, for a while on this panel um, that have supported uh, myself as well as the larger community of equity, but beyond equity um, as well. And I come to this, you know, I'm a pediatrician, preventive medicine, public health doctor. Um, I think, you know, most people probably know about the work of starting centers for health equity in various places. Um, and health departments, New York City being one of them, very honored to see Michelle and continuing the work and leading with such um, um, strength, really, and courage uh, and fortitude in the way that is absolutely needed um, in this position. Um, and I think also, you know, bringing to this conversation, um, you know, right now I'm actually currently sitting in Antigua, where my family is from. And um, I've really tried to work um, and working in its work to find space for rest um, and to find space to um, get grounded um, so that I can be in better community for myself with others, um, but also in solidarity um, and bring in more joy as well. So it's just awesome to be here. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Maybank. Uh, so we're going clockwise. So now we'll go to Dr. Malika Fair, MD and PH. Uh, she's Senior Director of Equity and Social Accountability at the American at the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, thank you, Dr. Watkins. I agree with what has been said before. It's an honor and a privilege to be uh, with you all this early in the year. Um, and I appreciate what um, Dr. Morse just said about a spirit of hope. And so I come to this call with a uh, with hope because we're starting a new year and at my role at the Association of American Medical Colleges with representing the medical schools and the teaching hospitals we have a whole generation of students and learners who are excited to join uh, not only healthcare um, and being physicians in particular, but also in this fight for justice. Um, so I am energized um, by their passion, by their persistence, um, and by our collective mission to, to do better and to change the system that we have. Um, my background is in emergency medicine, so I also have a sense of urgency uh, that has to be um, <laughs> controlled uh, so that we don't get into a white supremacy culture, but also understanding what is urgent and what has to be um, acted upon and we can't be complacent. So it's a pleasure to join this conversation today. Thank you so much. And then um, rounding out the panel, we have Dr. Stella Sappho, MD, MPH, founder of Just Health Equity for Health. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. It is a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm Stella Sappho. I'm an HIV primary care physician. And I come to this work both through personal experience of 
being in a very toxic work environment and experiencing discrimination that way, but also seeing what my patients, primarily my patients living with HIV, have experienced in navigating the healthcare system. And so my career has really taken on this question of how do we create more equitable care models for patients, for all of us, because all of us will eventually be patients. And in that work, I've worked with a large health system as well as with a large healthcare improvement company. And one of the things that I have kind of come to is that we have to build some of these systems and some of these work um, verticals ourselves. And so I am the proud founder of Just Equity for Health, which is a healthcare improvement company that combines advocacy, education, and care model design to really put forward equitable care models within our healthcare system. So I'm excited to be here because I think I offer a little bit of an outside in perspective um, and a little bit of that kind of rabble rousing, you know, kicking things up. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can kind of think about how we move forward in our goals, both from the inside and from the outside. Thank you so much, Dr. Sappho. And so as we hop into the conversation, um, the first section of the conversation, we really just want to, even before we um, get to some of this, the bigger topic, just really acknowledge, you know, the harm of the past. You know, we don't come into this work as, you know, uh, blank slates. You know, we have histories, we have pasts that we came out of that helped create us, inform us. The things that informed us even get into this work, um, this healing work, right? But when we think about the, the, you know, some of the heavy topics that we talk about, you know, we're talking about inequities, we're talking about, um, we're talking about death, right? We're talking about harm, we're talking not just numbers, though. These are humans, these are family members, these are neighbors, these are friends. And so when we um, have these conversations and we enter this work, I, I think the first question I want to know is, what is the role of wellness? How do we keep ourselves, you know, well? How do we keep ourselves centered as we, as we are sorting through all the rubble and all the wreckage? Um, and whoever wants to come off first can, uh, can go. I think Dr. Maybach needs to lead us in this because she's really embodying it in Antigua. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stella. I appreciate that. Um, you know, so there's so many ways to go uh, with this. Um, but, you know, well, I consider wellness really to be a part of an equity strategy. And I, I, don't, I think oftentimes, you know, when you're in institutions, and I've worked mostly in institutions, they're segregated, right? There's a wellness strategy and there's an equity strategy, as an example. And I think that really these should be strategies that are emerged. And I learned uh, actually interesting, when I first started this role at AMA, it was ESPN that reached out to me. And they wanted me to do, you know, a, a talk with their teams and their internal teams about the work of anti-racism that we were starting to embark on at AMA and what's the institutional change work and what does that look like, who's involved in everything. And they said, well, it's part of our wellness work. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of a, a kind of a twist in terms of how an institution, you know, can pull it together. And so, you know, for me, you know, ever since then, I've been really pushing internally at the institutional level to kind of merge and think about how are we, you know, merging the language of when we talk about equity and justice and workforce and what's happening in workforce and wellness, that we can't achieve that for our workforce unless we have strategies for equity, right? And we, most of us, you know, know Dr. Kamara Jones, it means we need to know our history. We need these to, we need to redistribute um, resources and power um, and to, to really acknowledge and, and do all of those things um, within our institution. Other than that, we're not going to get to the point of wellness. From a personal context, and I think it's aligned clearly with the professional and the work that I've been doing, it, I've learned a lot from watching my teams as well. I think many of us have watched um, the folks that we've worked with, whether it's providers or um, health workers in general, wherever they are, there's a level of exhaustion that's tremendous, right? And from listening to my team, being held accountable by my team, you know, and and, you know, them telling me, you know, this, this context of urgency that Malika mentioned, you know, how could we be urgent and take care of ourselves at the same time keeps coming up over and over and over again. And so I've had to really take pause, um, especially at the end of this year. You know, I, I realize I have themes of the year and my first, like two years ago, it was joy, bringing joy into my space. Last year it was love and using language of love, even spaces where most people are uncomfortable talking about love and, and why we do this work as you elevated Dr. Watkins. But now this year is it's about the rest and how do I really, 
really embody and lead in that space. Because if I don't do it, if my schedule is back to back, um, if I'm pushing for these initiatives to be put forward within the context of the institution that I work with, then I'm not really leading um, in a way that I think is needed for this time, at this moment in time for the movement. Um, and so, you know, I have um, made some changes. Um, and I, as, as Stella said, I'm in Antigua. Um, this is a very important place for me um, from just my family is here, my ancestors here, like literally they're here. I can, I feel it, the spirit's here with me. It helps me rest, but I've been here for three weeks and I've been off for three weeks. And I had, I've, I've never experienced being off for three weeks, I think since I ever started my career as a physician. Um, and uh, it's awesome, I will say, of course, but then what do I do to kind of bring that back? And so the commitment that I've made to my team is that we're going to be putting forward individual rest and recovery plans, as well as a collective rest and recovery plan for our Center for Health Equity. Um, and I have, I'm holding myself accountable to it. I'm reading, you, you mentioned your book and I'll shut up in a second, but this is what happens when you're on vacation for three weeks and then you get to talk to people like that you love. So I get to talk a lot, but just to let you know, I'm reading Rest is Resistance that I'm sure many of you have heard of um, by um, uh, Trisha uh, Hersey. I don't know if that's exactly how you say her name, but it's been really um, wonderful for me and I'm, I'm trying to embody and, and live as much of it as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. What resonated, you know, was bringing that spirit of love and rest into the work. And I think how just how radical it is that we can even name, you know, love as a concept or even as a moral principle in our work. Um, where, you know, I think traditionally, I think medicine, we kind of stay away from some of these more human or emotional things. And I think that is part of the downfall. Um, anybody else? If I could jump I'll in. I'll just add that I think, please, Dr. Fair, go ahead. Uh, just quickly, I when I think about this work, we always talk about how we want to ensure that individuals achieve their full potential and that barriers, inequitable barriers are removed. And if we really think about who the individuals are, you know, if people in my family, our patients, our colleagues, if we want us to achieve that full potential, I agree with everything that Dr. Maybank said, rest is a part of that. Um, and I think where we get off is when we focus on the broader mission and the broader goal without seeing the people. Um, and I find that the times where I have had off, even though sometimes they were traumatic experiences in my life, I felt that my colleagues, my supervisors, um, organizations I've worked with and for have been focused on me as an individual. Uh, and I love what you're doing, Dr. Maybank, with your team. I think that we have to remember who the people are. And when we see individuals, we see them holistically. We see that we need uh, to be healthy. We need to have rest and we need to see uh, each other as, as whole beings. And I'll just add to that, Dr. Fair and Dr. Maybank. I think the thing that really stands out for me, I remember when, about a year ago, when Bell Hooks passed away, the thing that I felt was, why do those among us that are visionaries, that are, you know, challenging us, why do they die so young? Um, and we know the statistics for black and brown people in this country. Um, life expectancy is much lower than the average. Um, but, you know, among those that are considered visionaries that are moving things forward, um, the work is so draining that I'm convinced that our telomeres are being attacked daily. And so we don't do well as we do this work. We don't have mental peace of mind as we do this work. So for me, I would say that rest is absolutely number one, two, and three, and, and not really even so much rest, like I'm sitting around watching TV, but mental rest. Because when you're invested in this kind of work, you're thinking about it all the time, you're riled up, you're upset, you're seeing it everywhere. Um, and, and it really does become one of those things that can just take you from a place of um, being able to turn it off to kind of always being on. And if you think about what it is that we're trying to do, which is to create a more equal society, um, those who are in positions of power, those who have privilege, they're resting. They're taking their time off. They're having their vacations. They're good, right? It's those of us who are fighting to make these things more equal that mm -hmm. are deeply unwell and, and, and in some ways like disturbed by everything. And so I, I see it not just as a thing to fill our souls, but also as actively and directly part of the work that if, if we can all thrive 
and live our best lives, that is our ancestors' dreams, right? Like that is what we are here to do and that, and that we're not gonna just be able to carry this burden on our individual backs, work ourselves to death, and then somehow, you know, we, we've done it. No, we are, just as Dr. Fair said, we are the product. We are the thing that we should be investing into and rest and joy and love are all part of that. I'll just say one one tiny um, addition, and I couldn't agree more with everything that's already been described. I think it's, I think it's progress just to actually be having an explicit conversation about how important it is to prioritize rest and space. That wouldn't have happened a few years ago, um, and so I, I I really want to also highlight the guilt that sometimes comes along with prioritizing rest, time for res reflection, space wellness, all of these things. Um, I think that there, there is uh, sometimes a belief that that's a luxury. That's something that only happens, you know, uh, for, for folks, for certain folks. Um, and I just think we have to fight that um, belief or that um, thread that's out there um, that rest is not for all of us um, or that it's a luxury or that we should feel guilty um, for in any way um, about making space for ourselves, for investing in ourselves, for being kind and gentle and compassionate with ourselves. Um, and so I hope that that um, conversation continues um, around the fact that we can't feel guilty um, about prioritizing um, our wellness and our health. Thanks, Dr. Morse. And you know what I hear um, resonating from folks' um, responses to that initial question is this real drive for, or this, I guess, brushing up against this culture that we kind of have in healthcare and in medicine. You know, um, hard to believe I finished my, you know, residency around 10 years ago. Um, and in that time, you know, we were working, you know, three 24 hour shifts in a week and work, you know, over a hundred clock and over a hundred hours. Um, and then it was just like, could you always have to just give more, give more, give more. Um, and just like this culture of burnout. And I think, you know, for me in the last few, um, in, over this last year working with residents, uh, rotating in, um, in um, the Center for Health Equity, what I noticed, you know, these folks, their entire training was during the time of COVID, you know, when they kind of see the burnout, they kind of see that moral injury of just having to just sacrifice and sacrifice and give, 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 but not be fully kind of recognized and, you know, valued or seen as a human being also experiencing this, it really makes me just think like, what are the, how are these institutions or have our institutions or the culture of our, of our discipline, how have they harmed the providers? And I guess the, the next part is, and, and what can we do differently? Um, how have they harmed us or, you know, those folks just getting into the work um, and what, what can change or what is a change that we hope to, you know, instill as we have this conversation? Well, I can start, you know, when I think about how academic medicine, medicine in general has harmed providers, uh, there's so many things that you can think of, but I want to focus on the providers who are in this health equity and this health justice space um, because oftentimes we're asked to not only perform clinically and, and give 100% to our patients, um, but also to mentor, uh, to sit on committees, to lead um, equity related work for an organization. And I think one of the ways that our institutions continue and medicine in general continue to uh, contribute to harm is putting it on the back of one person. Uh, is not providing protected time, not providing resources, not providing staff support, uh, not getting mm -hmm. giving it the elevated the elevation that it deserves and the space to be creative and to be supported. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see an office of one person or 0.25 FTE that is expected mm -hmm. to transform an entire institution, um, and that trickles down to the entire institution because you'll see uh, that new faculty member that's joined that's expected to join six committees as well as uh, make sure they're on the promotion and tenure track. So I think we have a, a responsibility to not put health equity, health justice, and anti-racism work on one person, uh, but collectively it has to be the responsibility of all of us. Mm -hmm. I think another way that we see it is the very institutional supports that are meant to be there to help folks when they're experiencing racism, sexism, any kind of discrimination within their institution often fail. 
And so I'm speaking of this from direct knowledge. One of the reasons why I think clinicians will speak up um, sometimes isn't even for themselves. It's often for their patients. If you're seeing, you know, we have a practice in New York of like putting patients in the hallway because we've been overcrowded in our ED or on the floors or other practices that you're just concerned about. Um, and when you see certain practices that you're concerned about and you're in an environment where you yourself may be facing discrimination, one of the biggest challenges that I have I have definitely experienced firsthand, but also had, you know, now I think over a hundred people plus tell me just because of the role that I sit in, um, is that they have had a challenge when they've gone to their institutions, human resources or other reporting bodies being heard and being taken seriously. And what that does is that that's the kind of institutional gaslighting and um, undermining that adds to the moral insult, right? And so you're experiencing something that is damaging to you or is concerning to you or is damaging to your patients and you're trying to kind of raise the alarm and you lack that institutional support. Um, there are many, you know, we can talk about solutioning, um, you know, down the line, but there's, there's many things that I think are then needed. And this is one of the reasons why it becomes important that you have a network and a community, because if your institution and your leadership can't support you in those instances, it's important that your concerns are validated by other individuals who are around you, by your mentors at your medical school, by other peer mentors that you can reach out to. And that's the way for some individuals that you'll be able to survive within uh, what can be a very challenging system within academia. If you're being gaslit by your institution, um, it, 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 you're not going to do very well down the line. And so building other structures that provide that support, I think, become incredibly important. Yeah, to build on that um, in two different ways, and I can't, couldn't agree more, and collective care is actually what came up in my mind as we finished the actually previous segment. But um, Dr. Sappho, I make shift to first names because that's what's comfortable. And mm -hmm. if that bothers anyone, please let me know. But that's also the beauty of this space, right? So I think I, I really want to speak to that because oftentimes we don't acknowledge the relationships that we have outside of medicine per se. I don't know if we won't even say it's outside, like all of it's part of our lives, right? Our political, our passions, our professional tend to align. And that's actually a very beautiful thing on many levels. And so I want to speak truthfully to that, that, you know, you know, Michelle and, and, and Stella, especially, as well as Malika, like we have met, they are my community. There are many times when I have gotten texts, we are on text chains, you know, that they have reached out and said, are you okay? You know, and I think we've done that vice versa. We send jokes. Stella sends baby pictures that are awesome, you know, of her, of her baby. All these things are really important in terms of collective care. Um, but we don't talk about that enough. And we almost feel like we can't or we shouldn't. People shouldn't know that. And I'm like, why? Who's telling us that? Who's, who, who are we believing? Everybody else has relationships. White supremacy mm -hmm. in the context understands the power of the collective. They understand mm -hmm. relationships and the importance to get the work that they want to get done and to hold on to power. We understand it because it's important for power, but also important for care. And so I just, mm -hmm. I want to really um, encourage us to embrace the relationships that they have, that we have rather, um, and understand that they are important for our wellness, important for our nurturing, important for mitigating harm. Um, and, and potential preventing harm as well. You know, Michelle knows the experience and, and Michelle's experienced this, we all have, of receiving, you know, threats, you know, to our lives. It was Michelle that I, you, she reached out to me, you know, honestly, I didn't know who to reach out to because it's not something we talk about, um, but reached out to me instantly and said, look, you need to do A, B, C, D, F, you know, in order to protect yourselves. And this is what your institution needs to be doing to make sure that they're protecting you and you're not having further harm. So I just, I really wanted to elevate, you know, the context of, of, of how do we also kind of manage and deal with harm, move through harm, understand harm is happening. And then the other point, you know, and this is, I guess this is the evolution of Aletha, because Aletha's, I, I think getting a, a little, um, becoming a little bit different and, and very much more direct, but the, I just want people to understand that the nature of a chief health equity officer role, like these aren't normal things. like these things shouldn't be happening. Like it is harmful no matter what, even having the role, like period. Like why do we need to be in spaces and places that have to convince people to care? Like that's what mm -hmm. I feel a role is and what I'm coming down to in terms of the work that I do, right? At the end of the day, it's about how much you're willing to care about somebody else. How much are you willing to listen to somebody else's human experience to understand what they're going through 
and then know that you haven't seen it potentially and then do better. That's our work. The data part of it clearly is important. All those things are important, but that's not the point of where I feel at this point in time in doing this work, that people actually move and shift um, as individuals and as communities. So I just wanted to, to put it out there for folks who are leading this work that this isn't how it should be. We shouldn't have to do this. Amen. Uh, Dr. Morris, I saw you came off mute. Um, did you have anything to add? We want to let that sit for a bit. I'm loving all of these words and I'm, I'm already like feeling more well myself actually just um, hearing from my, my friends and colleagues on the panel. The, the only thing I'll add is I think sometimes when we're under attack and our work is often under attack, we as individuals are often under attack, our communities are often under attack. I think sometimes the response can be um, kind of I don't want to say regress, but but kind of a fear response. And that's natural, right? That is a natural response. Um, and I think one of the things I've been trying to work on myself, and this is a, an organizing response, is instead of suffering alone or um, kind of, you know, moving inward when those attacks happen, how do we move outward? How do we build deeper connections? How do we share the experience? How do we share the burden? Um, and how do we, you know, avoid um, those attacks causing isolation and rather turn them into a moment for organizing, for movement building, for solidarity, for deepening relationships, for deepening the work that we're doing together? Um, because that is what healing justice is. That's what collective care is. That is how we move from um, you know, these attacks creating isolation in our movement into um, all of us actually learning from what the attacks mean and then collectively responding to the attacks in a way that strengthens the movement and strengthens our work. So, um, and that's, that has not been natural, that has not been easy. And I, I would say I am very much still in a process of trying to make sure that that's my immediate response when this continues to happen. Thanks for that. And I think, you know, I think to put a fine point on it, you know, uh, community is not a luxury. You know, I think it's something that we desperately need in our lives. You know, when we think about that African proverb, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I think it takes a village to hold that child into adulthood, to help them age, right? And if you have an unhealthy village, how can you expect, you know, the child to grow up and live a healthy life, you know, to their maximal potential? Um, and I think as we kind of pivot to, you know, this present moment and meeting the present moment, I really just wanted to um, highlight what you said, Alita, about how ridiculous it is, right? To know that we don't, that it shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be this hard. You know, if we live in a civilized society, we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, how is it that some people just cannot see all of us, that there's people who, you know, and when I say all of us, the collective all of us, you know, not just black folks, but queer folks, folks living with disabilities, folks, you know, who may not speak English. Um, how is it that people can think they know so much about us, but don't even know the first thing, you know? How are people so blind? Or what is that gap, you know, that, that empathy gap that we can't understand that people who are oppressed, you know, disenfranchised may have an opinion? <laughs> or take on some things, you know, that some folks may actually want the same things as everyone else, a little bit of safety, a little bit of freedom, you know, a little bit of love. And so when we think about what we're up against and that gap, that disconnect, that severance that I think, you know, comes with white supremacy and the divide and conquer nature of it all, um, you know, I don't think that the numbers necessarily will do it. You know, we kind of, we know all the numbers. We have all the data. You know, we've done the research. We have the stats. We have the graphs. We, you know, we have the articles, you know. But when we're thinking about how do we kind of respond to the moment right now, looking at the tools, looking at all of the, you know, the connection, all of what we have, how do we activate change? You know, how can we start to shift the culture and kind of get involved in this cultural work? A lot of it, you know, we're not getting cultural work. We didn't get that in our medical training. But like, how do we integrate these other forms of knowledge, um, these other kind of um, yeah, encyclopedias of wealths of knowledge and, and ways of knowing to activate the change that we need in this moment with all of the data and all the stuff that we already have and is always being reported on? 
That's a hard one, but I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. I think the thing that comes to mind immediately for me is um, the importance of showing up as you are. And that leads into the importance of using different platforms to show up as you are. And so if we think about classic academia, our communication mechanisms, our grand rounds, uh, manuscripts and medical journals, um, you know, uh, morning reports, there's just the ways that we're showing up are in these very professional kind of cookie cutter spaces, which is appropriate and correct for the work that we're doing there. But if we're thinking about changing the culture and bringing in um, ancestral ways of really movement building and, and you know, healing, that isn't going to be done necessarily in a morning report or in a grand rounds. And so it makes me kind of think a little bit about what spaces are we creating that allow us to show up as our full selves. And I think one of the places that that can happen, although it can be a cesspool of misery, is social media. And social media is interesting because it allows you to see some of the individuals that you would not normally kind of have access to as their full selves. One example I'm thinking about is a woman who does a lot of work on fertility, who also shares about what it was like for her to go through her own fertility struggle um, and for her to raise her kids. And, you know, and, and this is like a whole person who obviously is a very, very well-known clinician who's known primarily for her work. Um, and then she'll talk about equity issues that she thinks are important, um, you know, that relate to the work. And so there is a way in which I think we have to think about some of the spaces that we're putting ourselves into. And I will plug here that I think it's important, especially for young trainees, to very carefully think about what not exactly brand, because I hate that term, but kind of what persona they're cultivating for themselves that allows them to share information going forward. Um, and and that is different than the way that I would say all of us on this panel trained, right? When we were kind of coming out of residency, it was you get your academic job and you're kind of in that space or you work in an institution and you're in that space. And now the reality of the matter is that you can present yourself in other spaces in a more holistic way um, that I think will allow you to speak truth to power in certain cases. As as an example for myself, you know, being in this um, federal lawsuit about age and race discrimination against one of the large healthcare systems in New York City, we had to understand how we could tell our story and tell it honestly. And so we've used social media, we've used classic traditional media to do that because it's felt important for us to say, this happened to us. Those of us who trained at these big academic centers and have these big titles, this happened to us. So we know that it happens to other trainees and other individuals. and. We know that this type of discrimination happens to our patients, and that's what we care about addressing. Um, and so I just think it's important for us to think about how we can create spaces that allow us to show up as our whole selves. And as a potential tool, are there parts of social media or other platforms that allow us to do that in a way that's comfortable and true and authentic that can really reach the masses and, again, help us to be more in community than to kind of live in the ivory tower that I think many people who are in our profession can, can kind of tend to be in. If I could jump in, something you said, uh, Dr. Saffo, earlier in the conversation, and you mentioned about community, how important it is to have someone who validates you. Um, and what I heard from your last comment is there are so many people within uh, within our institutions, and especially the learners, who need to hear that validation from, from those of us who've been here a while. And I think it's our responsibility when we see someone showing up as their authentic self, and they have their story to tell, uh, that we are part of um, their village to validate them. Uh, I always think about White Coast for Black Lives and their report card um, that came out several years ago that they continue to update and, and other students across the nation that have taken it upon themselves to evaluate their own institution, uh, to create demands, to uh, come up with what they want to see um, change in their institution. And it has made a difference. And I think that that's a culture shift from what it was when we were training and when we were in medical school. And I think it has to continue with that validation, with sponsors, uh, with mentors um, who are willing to open those doors and create that space uh, for the next generation of physicians to do things differently and to make sure that their voice is heard um, because they're, they do not seem to be complacent uh, with the status quo. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Neither were we, uh, but I think it's even um, more uh, dramatic the way that the, um, they are showing up, and I think it's great. Thanks for that. Um, and, oh, go ahead, Dr. Morris. I was going to pass it to you anyways. <laughs> <laughs> On the same page. I, yeah, again, just 
love so much what Stella and Malika have, have already said on this particular point on, on what's activating, how do we get, how do we get activated, stay activated. Um, I think a part of the way I've seen it work effectively as well for motivating, activating, et cetera, in addition to students, it's the more we can ensure community ownership of the levers of healthcare, I think the more likely that activation is to be sustained. And oftentimes we have conversations amongst ourselves about all of the challenges, the inequities, the, the systems of oppression that prevent us from providing um, the best care and the most just care. And those are important conversations, right? We do need to build that alignment and, um, and consensus within our field. And at the same time, when the information that we know about the inequities at our institution is shared with community members, the communities that we serve, um, there is a completely different level of response, of activation, of, um, of push for change. And I think sometimes it becomes so normalized for us to just see these inequities play out day after day after day, we become desensitized, right? There's also a certain uh, moral injury, of course. Uh, I saw Dr. Maybank and uh, Dr. Mate speaking about this at the um, Institute for Healthcare Improvement keynote just a few weeks ago. Um, those things, unfortunately, can be really sedating, right? Just seeing mm. these inequities play out over and over again. And so I think the more we make sure that that information is not ours and is in the hands of the communities that we serve, as much as possible is democratized, is, um, you know, again, is, is owned by communities, um, the more likely we are to have a sustained movement um, in this space. I would like then to add, and I, I completely agree with that. And when I, when you were talking, um, Dr. Morris, what I thought about is just around the context of narrative and our ability to have power over the narratives that we tell. And I think it's mm -hmm. aligned with Dr. Saffo, what you said as well, in terms of being able to show up who we are as we are, right? And because we're controlling our narrative really as as we do that. Um, and I think at this point in time, that's a, a really important part of our work of the narrative clearly of how we're not, um, and we've all heard this, how we're not blaming people because that's kind of some of the habit that we get into within institutions. When you start to present data from a deficit perspective, you know, what we three times more likely to have, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's exhausting for us. It's exhausting for the communities that we come from, that we're a part of, that we're serving, to hear it in that frame and that narrative a lot. And so how do we also work to shift, you know, what we're presenting towards a more strength-based, asset-based kind of way? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's all in the line with kind of community organizing. It's about the power. How are we building and uh, acknowledging our inherent power that exists in order to create change and to build change. And I think we have to kind of shift to that. I go to um, Brookings Institute, Andre Perry um, published a report on, I think it was the Black, I'm gonna get this a little bit wrong, but the Black Progress Index, something of that nature, where it's really looking at cities and Black cities that have been doing well. What are those things that allow cities to build and do well, whatever well, however well is defined? And I think we need to focus more on that um, in the context of the work that we do. That shapes narrative, it shapes our actions, it shapes who we engage um, and how we create solutions and then also how we invest in solutions and who are we, who we are investing in. I always think about, I had a friend who was formerly incarcerated and um, did his best to not get incarcerated again, basically, and, and stayed out knowing that the recidivism rate is like 66 percent and i'm like we need to look at that 33 percent of folks who stay out what's happening with them what are they doing what are the what's the context of their lives how do we build that more into the work that we're doing um and i think that's where um you know and, and i don't think it's the the framed mindset of that is not a new thing again that's a community community organizing perspective um, and I think we need to incorporate that kind of perspective of community organizing more so into the work that we do um, in health and in public health and in healthcare, within institutions as well as external to institutions. Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, when I think about health equity and the work that we do, you know, I think often people kind of dismiss it or talk about it as like this pie in the sky concept. 
but there's some very concrete things that are going on. You know, when I think about health equity, this is integrated work, right? This crosses disciplines, this crosses, you know, timelines, you know, we're working on stuff from the seventies and the eighties, you know, we're responding to harms from the, you know, <laughs> from 1619 onward, you know, we're also building the future at the same time. You know, we are reconstituting and restructuring what public health looks like, what health care as an institution, what a health department, you know, in the largest city in the world, you know, in the, in the nation can look like. And I think that it's so important. And I think, you know, speaking to what you were saying earlier, Stella, um, it reminded me of this quote from uh, the poet Lucille Clifton, when she says, people need windows and mirrors. You know, people need windows to be able to see others, but they need mirrors to be able to see themselves, but like a true version of themselves. And I think for me, I think one of the main harms that I experienced in medical training and in even the practice was anytime we I was mentioned or I saw myself reflected in like a question stem or in a textbook, it was always associated mm -hmm. with something pathological, you know? And it's like, how can we rescue our narratives? You know, how can we, you know, our, um, our character has been assassinated <laughs> for hundreds of years. How can we rescue that and give uh, these, our students, our colleagues, ourselves the space to show up and, uh, and advocate for the things that are owed us, not beg, we're not begging, you know, at the door of, or, you know, at the, t at the crystal tower. We're asking, we're, we are demanding what is ours. You know, we paid, we built this country, we paid for this country, we work our behinds off to get to where we are, you know, and just really claiming that narrative and really um, <coughs> claiming the space that is ours. And I think really just us stepping into that moment. And I think, you know, the four of you, I think are so um, inspirational in that moment, in that sense, to be able to kind of see ourselves reflected. You know, I don't think that it's, um, it's not by any happenstance that I think the people leading a lot of this really transformational work in health equity happen to be black and a lot happen to be also women. I think that there's some, there's power in these identities that are so-called marginalized. Um, and so as we kind of look, you know, for like what's going on now in this moment and the power that we do have, I heard, you know, community as a power. I heard, you know, authenticity to self as a power, as one of the powers that we can tap in. Are there any other um, power, you know, sources of power or strength that, that you've tapped into, you know, to meet this moment, um, to try to address all of the many crises that are going on um, and also kind of, you know, stay centered and not lose sight of, you know, the primary goal, which is health equity. I mean, for me, family was one, you know, and being more expansive, right? Looking beyond just the biological family, building those community networks, you know, that those people who you can go to, um, and just really, that was really powerful. And just knowing chosen family is big too, and you know, or spiritual, however you want to call it, family. These things, you know, just tapping into family has been one. History has been another one, really unpacking that. I think the power of art, um, um, it's broadest spectrum, you know, and I think, um, Art, especially for me, is visuals and films. And, you know, I have some things that I'm doing in that space that I'm really excited about. Um, but, you know, I think the ability to um, tell stories and share stories um, through arts, whether it's writing or, again, visual films or, or visual like pictures and colors, uh, I think it's a very powerful um, vehicle. Um, one, because it's, it mixes, I think, the feeling along with the intellectual for me. Um, and so being able, and I think for many of us in communities, and, and it also brings us together as community. Um, and it can be a vehicle for expression and a vehicle for understanding. And so our ability to tap into kind of the arts and expression, I think, is very critical. And I also think, um, I because I'm around a lot of it right now, and um, I love the water. I think the power of nature um, and being able to connect to that, would, however you and however you enjoy it. For me, it's water. Um, also, is something that I, I tap into, um, and that grounds me. For me, it's also the power of fun. 
you know, we shouldn't have to do this work, but we can enjoy it um, with the teams that we have, with uh, the colleagues that we're working with, whether it's the text change that Aletha was talking about or making space within our teams to really get to know each other and enjoy each other. Um, you know, even my team, my, uh, Yuna and I did a cooking class together. And mm -hmm. even though we were all deeply committed to this work, um, in that moment, I don't really know how to cook. So I learned a lot from my colleagues and I remembered why, how much, how important it is to learn from others and how to enjoy what you do. I love the story all of those. About, um, oh, please. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna quickly add that for me, it's the power of kind of investing and remembering in what we've survived. Um, my mom came to this country and had to do her medical degree over. Um, I have been through so many insane things from, you know, escaping from the Liberian Civil War and just the things that we have been through. Sometimes I think when I need to draw further strength, I think, Stella, if you have survived all of those things, if your mom could do all of those things, if your ancestors could do all of those things, certainly you can continue. Um, and I think that sometimes we forget how badass we are, you know, and you have to kind of look back and remember, like, you know, you're the one, you can do it. Um, and I think it becomes very important, just as, as Malika mentioned, that we invest in fun because some of those, you know, I've survived um, memories can be very draining and very difficult. Uh, but, but it helps me to keep going, knowing what I've come through and knowing that I can, I can survive in whatever life throws at me. Amen. Um, I was just going to add it as a, I would say, recovering academic. Um, one of the things that I haven't lost is my interest and my commitment to learning and knowledge generation, production of knowledge, um, all of those kinds of things. And I'm also the daughter of a public school teacher. So um, I always talk about how my mom taught me to learn, um, taught me how to learn, taught me how to find joy in learning. Um, and so uh, I think one of the sources of power that I often find, it, it's easy to um, be lost in this moment in all the things that are happening or just be overwhelmed by the, um, the number of things that are in a moment of change or in a period of change across our society and across our world. Um, I'm often looking for things to ground me. And I just remember reading, I got to read um, the biography of Ella Baker um, that was written by Barbara Ransby. Um, and it's just one of those books that I constantly come back to as a reminder um, and as a, a way to just find inspiration, power, um, and to learn about the, the history, trajectory, path, um, work of this absolutely magnificent black woman um, who should be, you know, considered one of the heroes of the 20th century, um, but who very few people actually really know about, right? Um, and so to, to revisit stories and histories like hers um, always helps to ground me, always helps me to grow, to keep learning, to keep kind of nourishing um, my convictions and also nourishing um, the, the growth of my, uh, my own learning and knowledge. So I find tremendous um, strength in that. We're going to need a book list after all of this. There's so many good recommendations. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, right. exactly. I was going to say, um, last year, um, maybe the first year of COVID, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's all running together a little bit. Mm -hmm. I actually started um, music therapy uh, with a friend, um, Gordon Chambers, who's um, award-winning um, composer and writer and all of that. He lives down the street. Brooklyn's a wonderful place as we all, you know, three of us reside in Brooklyn. There's a lot of talent in Brooklyn. And so through the therapy, um, because I felt I needed something, I like music and I needed a different kind of outlet. The one day I came in and he said, Aletha, I need you to remember that your ancestors weren't just fighting for freedom and liberation, but they were fighting for your joy and go out and find mm -hmm. it. Like that was his command to me, like go out and find it in every single moment that you can think of. And so that that was really quite revolutionary for me as an individual. Um, and I just, I just echoing again, what, you know, um, Malika has expressed and Stella, as well as um, Michelle, just this context of joy and, and that we deserve it um, at all at all moments. Even if structurally it's hard to fully achieve, we still, we very much deserve it. We can find it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's that's one of the things that we can never lose sight of. You know, like life, no one's promised it would be a crystal staircase, you know, but we got to take the bitter with the sweet, you know. We have to really fight to make that space for the joy, for that human connection, for the love. Um, because I think, you know, in this, in being divided and conquered, I think that we've been separated from some really deep um, concepts. You know, like love had been reduced to, you know, chocolates and roses, you know, justice somehow, freedom and justice somehow in this construct of the United States had space for chattel slavery and genocide. You know, when we all think about these kind of other big topics um, that we kind of shy away from, I think we really have to go deeper. You know, there's so much depth to some of these bigger concepts um, that we kind of cut ourselves off from. Um, you know, thinking about the use of love um, in, in the work that we do. Because I think all of us, you know, we find different ways to name it. I think all of us kind of have expressed that we're, we are coming to this work from the space of love, you know, but it's not just, you know, the fluffy, but I think there's a sense of responsibility that I think that we all kind of bring to this work, you know, a responsibility and a love for the communities that we come from and that we serve, a love for, you know, our ancestors, a love for our children or the children in our lives and for future generations. Um, and so as we, <laughs> And as we think about, as we start to pivot to this, you know, looking forward, you know, looking to the future moment and the promise of the future, are there any concrete steps or advice that you have for students or trainees in this moment right now? Anything that, um, that you would recommend for folks to think about or consider as we look to the future? I guess we can start Trust with Trust yourself and, oh. Okay. No, you first, Stella. I was going to say, I was going to say, I think two very simple things. Trust your instincts. If your instincts are telling you that you're experiencing something, don't let yourself be gaslighted. Don't let yourself kind of not listen to yourself. I think many people will say, I wish I had brought that up sooner. I wish I had addressed it sooner, but I wasn't sure. So trust your instinct. Um, and um, I think really invest in community that will never fail you. It will always hold you up. Um, and so I would say, as you're so busy and so overwhelmed and doing all the things, just make sure you make time for the people in your life who, you know, are going to be there for you and carry you through the good and the bad times. I love that, you know, when I talk to students and they're wondering what medical school they should go to or what job they should take um, after residency or even what residency program, I often discourage them from looking at the rankings uh, and thinking about institutional reputation uh, just in terms of academic reputation but what is what is the fruit of the institution so what is really happening there um, and do the leaders believe in what they've stated uh, do they actually see resources being put forth towards uh, you know matters related to equity and sometimes we won't see that. Sometimes it is just a smoke and mirrors at institutions. And if they cannot find an institution that is truly committed, then they at least have to find sponsors and mentors at their institution or at the institution they're interested in going to. Um, I oftentimes was part of institutions that were evolving. And what kept me grounded were that people were there who believed in me and gave me the space to figure out what my purpose was, to figure out how I was going to show up, even if the institution wasn't on board yet. Um, but to have that protected space, to have people who believed in me, who sponsored me, who went to bat for me uh, with leadership, I think made all the difference in knowing that I wasn't out there alone. Um, I, I do remember a moment in residency when a, a flyer showed up in my, um, in my mailbox and it was the first time I felt seen. It was the first time someone I felt, oh, they finally get what I'm what I'm trying to do here. Uh, and I hope it doesn't happen at the end of residency uh, for the next generation. But I do think um, finding people who believe in you is really important. Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree. All that has been said so far, I think definitely trusting your gut. I think everything has been about the gut, you know, and what comes what comes that feeling that comes, you know, um, and and I think we all have really good guts, and so trust it um, in terms of where you want to go and the directions that you want to go. All the spaces that I've 
landed, um, something had to tell me internally and feel that it was the right place to go. And if it didn't, then it wasn't the right place to go or direction or even sometimes to say and how to show up. Um, I, I, I want to go back to what Stella said about the ability to show up as your full self because that's freedom to me. That's getting towards freedom per se. Um, when you can do that fully, I was joking around with, even with my boss. I said, you know, I realize I don't code switch anymore. And he said, <laughs> I know you don't. And, you know, and he's like, when you get really excited, you know, uh, you know, it really comes out in very different ways, whatever. But I think the ability to get there and be there is, um, it's quite awesome, truthfully. I understand that not everybody has the opportunity and the, the privilege, I guess, and the space to do that. But the more you can show up and be who you are, Claim it. It's you. It's it's wonderful. It's beautiful. And I think lastly, I'll just say grace. Um, giving mm. yourself grace, giving your grace, all those around us grace, um, that we are all mostly doing the best that we can. Um, but, you know, grace to know that we're not always going to be the best that we can sometimes and that we're going to potentially um, falter or make mistakes or just get something wrong that we didn't mean to get wrong or maybe some people didn't mean to get wrong i don't know but we have to give grace um I, i'm a full believer in that um in order to grow um and to learn and to settle into i'm okay and i'm enough um and i'm going to keep mm -hmm. moving forward and we're going to keep moving forward together and, and learn and grow from one another that's part of the caring environment and that's part of the solidarity environment from my perspective as well I totally agree. And I, I have to just say also, I feel like the, this era for the next generation of health workers and leaders, this era is so different um, than when I was coming up as a student in so many ways. I mean, I think on the one hand, the power of the Black Lives Matter movement, of Standing Rock, of um, you know, occupy all of these social movements just in the past decade um, that are reinforcing each other and building on each other. It is absolutely amazing. Um, and I feel like, you know, this generation, I know it may not feel like it, but I feel like you're so lucky to be training and growing into health leaders and health equity leaders at a time when social movements are literally at the tip of everyone's tongue and you have a chance to be a part of that both as health workers and as organizers. I think that is absolutely incredible. You should lean into that. You should see yourselves as a part of that. You should um, not hesitate at all um, to make yourself um, a part of these movements and not as a separate health worker space, but a part of um, what is already happening across our society, across the world um, in terms of social transformation. So I think that's, that's amazing. And at the same time, um, to be training um, and growing up as a health worker, as a health leader in uh, a once in a century pandemic, um, you know, is, is just un unprecedented. And I think for, for those of us on the panel, we were coming up in the AIDS movement and, and that was a pandemic of its own time um, with its own profound challenges. Um, but the, the speed at which COVID has spread around the world um, and the mm -hmm. intensity of the loss is is just unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, so I just have so much respect for trainees who are training in this moment, um, and I hope that um, I hope that that is felt um, by trainees as well, um, because I think for those of us who've who've come through training already, we have a duty um, to support you and to and to ensure that you have um, what you need to keep putting one foot in front of the other. So I, I do see that as a um, critically important role for, for those of us who've already come through training. And then I think the final thing I might say um, in thinking about the, the next generation and, and the organization I co-founded, Equal Health, we founded fully focused on um, inspiring, supporting, and engaging the next generation of health workers around social medicine, health equity, global health equity, et cetera. Um, I have to just say how 
important your vision is for changing the world. And mm -hmm. it's already happening, right? I mean, if you look at just the work around racism and clinical algorithms, that's like truly a medical student um, and health worker student led movement. And there's so many others. And so um, someone, Malika mentioned um, White Coats for Black Lives. There, there's so many examples. And so um, your vision is the future. Um, and I think we all have to do what we can to make sure that the, the space that's needed for that vision to become reality um, is there. So I think that's a commitment all of us share on the panel today. Thank you for that. And Michelle, I mean, Dr. Morse, I think you were getting at something that I've been, that's been on my heart for a minute, just about the era that we live in. I think as humans, we kind of are, you know, we kind of day to day live in the moment. And it's only like in the hindsight that we're able to kind of identify these very important or particular periods. And it seems to me that we've, we've been entering this, you know, health equity renaissance, this kind of social renaissance. And yes, our imitating life, we all love Beyonce, I love Beyonce, but thinking about <laughs> Renaissance period moment, right, where the level of understanding and the knowledge creation and just the 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 way that we're using the language and expanding the language and the understanding of these concepts, we are in this Renaissance era. You know, we're in an era that in 20 years we're going to look back and be like, wow, that was when healthcare in the United States did change in some fundamental level. We don't know how it's all going to pan out, but I know that we'll be talking about this. And you know, when we when we recognize and realize that we find ourselves in a major historical moment in a major historical era, I think that the question that comes to us, not necessarily the why, like why is everything happening, why is everything falling apart, but the real question is, what are you going to do about it? You know, how will you account for your time and for the space that you do take up, you know, and what did you do during that period? You know, were you quiet? Were you sitting at home comfortable or were you, you know, going for it? Were you showing up all the way? You know, were you bringing the ancestors, you know, and the future ancestors with you into the space to advocate? You know, were you tapping into your full self or did you leave all of that beauty and richness at home? I think that's the question of our time as we kind of enter this renaissance era, this uncharted territory. None of us have seen this before, you know? And then the world is being remade every day. And so this, you know, this question of how do we want to see ourselves or be seen or be useful in this time, I think is so critical and so crucial. And I think it's something for all of us to really ask ourselves at every level of our training or even post-training and every level of the work that we do. Like, how do we want to be in the world and what kind of change do we want to usher in um, and how do we want to be remembered? Um, I think it's so important. Um, but, you know, I guess pivoting back to, the, I guess one of the final questions is, um, I guess, you know, looping back to the beginning, any guidance or anything you want to say to your younger self, um, you know, to kind of, um, that you would have loved to hear or that you would want to, that message to that person? Because I think we kind of always have that young person, you know, our inner child or our inner young self there anything you wanted to say you want to say to that person um because i think the things that we say to ourselves i think other folks there's a message there for other folks that folks may want to hear too well i would definitely tell a younger malika uh that she cannot pour out of an empty cup um and i think mm -hmm. i felt that you know i could just keep going and going without taking that moment and rest is part of filling that cup but also you know, being grounded in my faith and spending time with my family and spending time with my friends, the things that we talked about earlier, making sure that I absolutely, that I feel like I'm contributing, but I'm also exploring, I'm also learning. And if I'm not doing, you know, what I've identified as my seven things that fill my cup, then I can't give and I cannot show up um, and be my authentic self. So I, I would tell her to sit down for a minute <laughs> and stop pouring out of empty cup um, and then keep going. I love this question. I'll, I'll just jump in because I just, I absolutely love this question. No one has asked me. I've been on a, a fair number of panels. No one's asked me this question before. And so I'm so thankful, <laughs> Dr. Watkins, that you came up with this one. Um, there's so many things. Oh my goodness. I'm just thinking of back, back to my med student and resident self. And I started med school uh, when I was 21. I went straight from undergrad and of course thought I knew everything. So I think my advice 
to myself um, would be to continue to nourish my humility, continue to um, keep my mind open um, and, and invest in the space in my mind to grow, learn, strategize, um, expand, um, and not just run at a thousand miles per hour. And, and I would say, you know, in med school and residency in particular, there was so much pressure to just absorb, absorb, absorb tons and tons of facts and not a whole lot of space for, for processing, for strategizing, for, um, for um, other types of knowledge um, besides what you read in, in all those great medical school textbooks. Um, so I would, I would say that you know, nourishing that humility, creating space for um, alternative sources of knowledge, and um, and and really continuing to to create space for those sources of knowledge to be central to my learning and growth. And I think uh, I would tell my younger self that uh, you know you're going to be fine, Stella. I think when I was younger, I used to create all of these worst case scenario, this and this happens, and what will you do? And I just had, you know, I, I would make lists every new year, speaking of the new year of like, this is what I'm gonna get done, here's how I'm gonna do it. I was just, I don't know what I was doing, but I had a lot of plans and I had a lot of thoughts that if this thing didn't work out in this way, well, everything would be ruined then, right? And, you know, I think many of us that are type A, many of us that are exceptional scholastically, many of us that are doing something that people in our family haven't done or other people who look like us haven't done, put so much pressure on ourselves. And, you know, I would tell my younger self that you're going to be fine. You're going to encounter some really horrible circumstances. You're going to switch the way you thought your career would go. You're going to be humbled. You're going to, you know, just face challenges that you could never imagine. And you're going to be fine. And from just being fine, you're going to find a way to thrive. Um, I think that sense of comfort is something that many of us are missing when we're young because we think that if we fall, we won't be caught. And no, there's there's a net under you. You'll be fine. You'll be caught. You'll get back up. You'll keep going. Um, I would tell my younger self that, that you're going to be okay. I think building very similar to that, I, it's kind of a little bit what I said earlier, just that uh, that I'm enough and that I was enough and that you're enough, you know, um, because I think that harboring the viewpoint of I'm not doing enough contributes to the lack of rest. It contributes to kind of the sense of urgency, um, especially for us as black women that we must produce, we must show up, we have to do that. And, and oftentimes we did, you know, because of our, our circumstances, whatever was there. But I think a constant um, message um, for me specifically, that I was enough, you know, and all that I have, my talents and who I am, my knowledge and my my likes and my dislikes and my mistakes, it's fine. It's all enough. Same with kind of what Stella is saying, I think is, is you know, what I would have told myself. And then I was thinking, actually, what came to my mind was also invest in that house, invest in that brownstone <laughs> that was like offered to you. It's like that kind of advice, like that practical advice that sometimes we don't get, you know, um, as people of color and communities of color mm -hmm. um, and the conversations that we don't have, um, you know, and, the, and I'll be explicit conversations around like fertility and things of that nature. Like mm -hmm. there were a lot of things that I wish, you know, as a woman I could have had because I did have you know, either the siblings or the community that's going to talk about these issues that become very important at this point in life. Thank you for that, um, everybody, for sharing. Um, you know, I think the, the question that comes out of, I think, this kind of personal investigation myself, you know, responding to the impox outbreak and everything, it wasn't being, being ready. It, feels, it felt like all of this, you know, training, everything was like, just getting ready for something big, you know, and, you know, coming out of, you know, sexual health uh, work and HIV related work. I felt like I've been, I was preparing for COVID and then impacts for my whole career. And then to just be ready and to pull all of that knowledge, it really just felt like, you know, like that, that like you are enough, but we don't, it's not that you're just enough, that you are more than enough, that you are the answer. You are like, we are, you are the ones that we've been waiting for. The world needs 
you know, needs us to be engaged. The world needs our perspectives. You know, it needs that connection to the history. You know, it needs that connection to being able to recognize signs and discern. You know, a, a major question that, that came out of um, the book that I recommended earlier, Making Space for Justice, comes from this political scholar, Judy um, Sklar, and she asks the question, when is a disaster a misfortune and when is it an injustice? And thinking about that, I think, you know, from where we come from, I think being able to discern the difference is so vital in this moment, you know? And that's one thing that we are able to recognize really well. You know, when you come from a people and you have experienced the lack of justice, you know what it looks like. You know how to see that coming a mile away. You know, when you've experienced the lack of equity, when you felt the burn and the sting of the betrayal, you know, when you see that, you know, the Hippocratic Oath didn't extend to you, you know, you feel that. And I think we bring a very real experiential knowledge and richness and depth to the work. And I felt so kind of betrayed to have been cut off from that, to have people tell me, don't do that. You have to talk a certain way, you have to act a certain way. You can't, you know, you, this is how you talk. And I feel like that was, I feel like that was one of the main things that um, I would tell myself so I would have connected to that much earlier. Um, and that because it's just, that's where the magic is, you know? That's where the beauty is. That's where, when you think about, you know, the histories that, you know, where we kind of come from, black folks, you know, um, you know, people, you know, so-called marginalized people, the things that we were able to do in such dire times, you know, the beauty and the magic that we've been able to create and change the world, honestly, without all the guns. You know, we didn't have the guns, but we had our words, you know, we had our minds, we had our imaginations, and it was so powerful that we have been able to free ourselves, you know, from the shackles of chattel slavery in this country, we've been able to get some civil rights actions and we've been able to keep pushing and resisting in the face of all that we're facing, um, including this uh, once in a century pandemic um, of COVID-19. Um, so uh, we have um, just a few more minutes. I uh, just wanted to see if anyone um, had a point or any, um, you know, anything that they wanted to elevate or put a fine point on um, from, the, from the rest of the discussion. I would just say that I hope that what comes across for listeners is that we are all, you know, products in progress, that it may seem from the fancy titles and the polished ways we're kind of sharing everything that we figured it out. And I just hope that people understand that we are figuring it out. Um, and that, like us, you know, I hope that you take the time, the rest, the investment to think really actively about how you want to be in your career, you know, how you want to pull in equity work, how you want to be a citizen of this world, um, that that is a work of progress. And that's something that you don't arrive at, but it's it takes work. And, and I hope you see that we are all doing the work. We're reading the books. We're having the conversations. And I just, I want to share that with people that it's worthwhile to do the work because I think we can get to a more perfect future for all kind of pushing ourselves and doing what we can. I, just, I want to acknowledge you, uh, Dr. Watkins, and you're, you're, you're guiding us through this conversation. Um, and I, the last part, I was like, wow, I wish you were in my head when I was younger. <laughs> you know, your <laughs> words were, were beautiful and, and I think point on um, for, for right now and, and, um, and for many people, but also the context of what you mentioned about we're in, we're in the moment now. We're in a renaissance now. We're in this moment. Like, and to really sit through that, like sit in that rather and through it, but sit in it, you know, what does that mean? And how do we want to show up? And, and no, I don't know so much about legacy because I don't, you know, that will determine itself, but you know, what is it in terms of the contribution that we really want to have, you know, during this time and that we can be very intentional and very active about it. I guess we have the roles in our institutions and there's a part of it that clearly is intentional, but there's a part of that that's kind of, a little bit kind of you're going we're going with the flow to some level but there's some other things that i think that we have to and have the opportunity to really embrace around what does it mean to holistically show up in this time during this moment that is going to be reflected upon um in the future as some moment of a great moment um of our, our of our society 
So I really thank you for um, elevating that and kind of framing and contextualizing that for us in this conversation and for those who are listening in. For me, it's been really inspiring just hearing everyone on this call, including you, Dr. Watkins, um, because it just reminds us of this really large and you know, inspiring community across our nation, across our world uh, of people who are fighting for justice and being present, uh, showing up and, and, and how we're not doing this alone, that we are together, whether we are physically together. I know a lot of you all are in New York and I'm over here in the freezing Midwest, um, but I feel very close to you. Um, and, and I think that we have to be reminded that even if we're in a tundra or we're on the beach or we're in Antigua, which sounds amazing, Aletha, um, that we're fighting together um, and we're resting together and we're experiencing joy together. Yeah, I'll, and I'll just say one, one um, brief thought, which I mostly have learned from Dr. Watkins, but also from all of the other incredible women on this, on this call, um, which is just how we can't take for granted um, that these, that the spaces that we're creating, that the space, this space, um, and other spaces to be able to to take a pause and reflect, um, organize our thoughts, remember what inspires us, keep that at the center of our consciousness and our thinking, um, and be able to to you know grow in spaces like this because this isn't exactly a space of rest, but in a way it's a space for rest, right? Rest and reflection, mm -hmm. and and for deepening our consciousness and our and our alignment, and again our our a shared analysis of of what the challenges are that we face. So. Um, I just can't say how important I think it is that we continue to prioritize creating spaces like this for conversation, both public facing, internal, one-on-one um, -on -one and otherwise, um, because that's where all great ideas and change starts is in dialogue. So I'm just thankful for the dialogue today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for the kind words. And, you know, thank you for joining us, you know, in this conversation, in, commu in communion, you know, coming together from the different places that we sit to talk about a really important um, conversation. And I think some folks may be like, oh, well, what about the institutional accountability part of it? But I think you don't get there if we don't, if we're not ready to hold that accountability. You know, we got to get ourselves together. Um, so that we can actually help usher it in and be ready because someone's got to help hold someone accountable, you know, and it feels like maybe us, right? But we got to get ourselves ready. We kind of order ourselves, get ourselves right to know what it is that we are um, talking about, what it is that we're, that we hope is accounted for, you know, because there's a long, long history. Um, there's a lot that has happened. Um, there's a lot of names, um, you know, a lot of folks um, who have to be accounted for, you know, a lot of harm that has to be um, responded to. Um, and there's a lot of things that, you know, that we, there's a lot of deeper work that's going on. Um, but I think it all kind of comes from where, how are we, how are we preparing ourselves and where are we coming from so that we can get to the destination, you know? Um, and it is, as, as you said, Dr. Safo, it is a, commi a daily commitment. Is it, there's no magic bullet for this. You know, we're dealing with real human problems, with real human heart, hurt, trauma. We're dealing with a lot. Um, and there is no magic bullet. There is no easy answer. There's no one book. There's no one framework. There's no one tool. You know, it's about that commitment to really make the political personal, you know, to really see ourselves as healers, you know, versus these skilled technicians, you know, who master, you know, medic medications and cells, right? It's, it's deeper. We're dealing with social problems, you know, human problems, and we have to really be able to address them as such and not just limit ourselves to this kind of biomedical kind of scope um, that we kind of have gotten ourselves into. And so, um, you know, as we get ready to wrap, I just really just want to express my deepest and most sincere gratitude for all of the panelists um, for taking time out of your busy schedules to come here, you know, and have this really, I think, powerful conversation, revolutionary maybe, um, this conversation about a topic that I care about so deeply. My heart is so full. I want to thank everyone um, behind the scenes who helped set this up, the hours of work um, that went into setting this up, and everyone's teams. Um, I want to, uh, uh, shout out to um, you know, shout out to our HBCUs out there and everyone out there who's doing the work and all of the healthcare heroes, you know, in our great city but around this country who have really bore the brunt of this really once in a lifetime, um, you know, pandemic. This 
extraordinary mass traumatizing event um, who have stayed dedicated to the work and have shown up and especially um, special shout outs to folks who are in the health equity space. You know, I think that this is a revolutionary space. This is the primary space um, that we are really driving to advance our, our discipline, you know, to make it more human, to make it more coherent for the 21st century this diverse, beautiful, rich tapestry of humanity that is not just, you know, white. Um, so just really grateful and thankful for this space. And I guess I'll just end with uh, this quote from Ella Baker. Um, you know, when I think about health equity, um, I think about this quote from her. She said, this may only be a dream of mine, but I think it can be made real. So thank you so much. I think that we can make this dream real. Um, we've got to do it together in community, authentically ourselves. Um, thank you and have a lovely day, everybody.